Um, so this study was um, <clears throat> started at the request of the Bellingham Field Office with the Department of Ecology. And there had been some previous studies done in Whatcom County trying to look at this relationship between manure application, manure management, crop management, and shallow groundwater nitrate. And, and the reason for that was, as you can see on this slide here, um, all of these different uh, red dots uh, indicate uh, nitrate concentration in wells there, test wells or drinking water wells. And 29% uh, of those were greater than 10 milligram per liter, 44 uh, around 5 and 14% uh, greater than 20. So anyhow, just kind of give a little bit of a, a pectoral view of, of the issue in, in Whatcom County. So uh, I had the opportunity to... Now attending. I had the opportunity to join the group uh, as part of this research project. Our role was to kind of work on the... Um, the crop uptake, the manure applications, and uh, so kind of the triangle between the crop, the soil, and the manure. Um, so the purpose was to improve our understanding of nitrogen di dynamics in a manure field. Um, the objectives then were to characterize nitrogen inputs, the outputs, and the underlying groundwater nitrate concentration in what was considered a typical uh, manure field over the aquifer. So this was run on a commercial dairy. Um, and then also as a part of it, proposed some adjustments and management that uh, management practices might then result in minimizing uh, nitrogen leaching. So this is the actual study location <clears throat> and the arrows here give you some indication of um, groundwater, uh, general groundwater flow. The, uh, this is the actual study site right there, just below the Canadian border. So those of you who are familiar with the guide Guide Meridian, we're looking at Guide Meridian going right there, and there's the, the border crossing right there. Um, so anything that's blue is water, so you can obviously see uh, some of the interest in, in looking at nutrients and water in, in Whatcom County. This gives you a little bit of a, an idea of what the uh, hydrogeology looks like a bit with regard to sea level, and uh, Bertrand Creek was right there next to the study site. Um, then we have the Sumas Blaine Surficial Aquifer, and then the Everson Vashon Semi Confining Unit, uh, Bedrock, and um, gives you some idea and scale here on the vertical or on the horizontal axis of, of miles. Um, and uh, so I should also mention that we've got this whole interrelationship of uh, this big aquifer that's between um, um, Canada and and Whatcom County or, or, or the United States. So we've got this whole dynamic of, of water that doesn't know um, international boundaries. So we've got that whole dynamic to, to deal with as well. So you've seen this slide before. <clears throat> so what we tried to do, uh, part of this study, is characterize the pieces within this that we could uh, measure with some, uh, that we felt we could measure with some accuracy. Made estimates in other cases. And then again, uh, Department of Ecology's main role was to look at uh, groundwater um, uh, shallow groundwater and um, relate the management of that um, field to that shallow groundwater. So on a nitrogen mass balance, uh, what we had were, uh, we knew what the manure nitrogen inputs were, fertilizer, irrigation water. Um, they didn't use much irrigation water, but we did get nitrogen analysis on that, so we knew what the contribution was there. Atmospheric uh, input was estimated, so organic matter contribution was estimated. Outputs then, we were taking uh, grass samples every time that the producer harvested, so we knew what uh, estimated crop yield was. We had analysis done on that for nitrogen uptake then. Uh, volatilization, denitrification, again, were estimates. Um, soil nitrate, we um, looked at soil uh, values on a monthly basis throughout the whole year, but intensively from about the middle of August through no attending. about the middle of November, we were taking weekly soil samples. And then uh, groundwater nitrate, um, so ammonium and so organic matter were analyzed uh, approximately once a year. Uh, this uh, lower hand picture shows one of the monitoring wells, and this is Barb there um, pulling samples out through the, the monitoring system and the filter system there. So this slide gives you an idea of uh, some of the data we collected. Um, this upper left hand panel here is pounds of nitrogen in the manure and inorganic fertilizer was provided. So um, the red bars 
are the amount of ammonia nitrogen that was applied. So that would be the form of nitrogen that was readily available for uptake by the crop, uh, particularly that given year. The blue uh, part is the organic nitrogen that would have been applied. Um, so you can see in most cases, this first year or so, we had a um, uh, higher percentage was in the ammonium form, whereas in subsequent years, it tended to be more of a 50-50 of organic nitrogen and inorganic nitrogen. The um, green bars are inorganic nitrogen. You can see on a couple occasions, particularly in 206 and 207, they were applying uh, a bit of inorganic nitrogen as well. But anyway, get, get some idea of what the approximate uh, manure applications were looking like in terms of nitrogen. Then um, there was about a four to five cutting scheme uh, through the course of that summer then, uh, early spring through early fall. And on the lower right-hand panel then, we're looking at total nitrogen applied um, throughout the course here. So what you're doing is collapsing these individual bars into a total amount applied. So here in 2005, 645, about 400 uh, pounds, uh, plus or minus here a bit in 2006 and 2007, and then 2008, up around 700 pounds. So a couple years where we had higher rates, and two years where we had um, these rates around 400. <clears throat> then if we look at comparing the nitrogen applied to the nitrogen removed in the crops, we see here, um, again, this is nitrogen harvested, so we're somewhere in the neighborhood of, on the low end, maybe 393. Um, in 2008 and on the high end maybe about 457 pounds of crop removed nitrogen so that's in the above ground portion so it would still be nitrogen in root mass but you're not really uh, able to, to estimate or measure that then again from the previous slide these are the um, amounts of nitrogen was applied so you can see that in years 2006 and 7 we we're approximating the actual amount that did get removed in crop uh, crop removal nitrogen Whereas in 2008 and 2005, there was uh, quite a bit more nitrogen applied. And that's going to play out in, in terms of the subsequent results. Um, okay. So if we look at soil nitrates, um, then this is over the two, four, 2004, 5, 6, 7, and 8. We see um, uh, quite a bit of variability. These boxes here try to capture that window during the fall when you would uh, typically try to uh, would be the sampling window for this uh, post-harvest nitrate test that Dan Sullivan talked about this morning. Um, you, occasionally you'll see some spikes like this. So, and in a number of these, when you see some of these spikes, so you can go back and look and see that they are related to uh, manure applications and responsive to that and or rain. So we get that uh, mineralization going on. These are the average groundwater nitrates. So the previous slide was soil. These are groundwater. So you can see that we're above that 10 uh, 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 milligrams per uh, liter on uh, nitrate nitrogen. Um, and we had, we had this big spike here and then it trended down and we were able to pretty much stay below those last uh, couple of years, although it trended up here again at the end. Now, one of the things here at the beginning I'd like to point out is that right before we went into this study, the dairyman tilled the soil, replanted it to a grass crop. And so that was really fortunate for us because that was, it created a great opportunity for us to then begin to see, you know, what happens when you till up that, that soil and, and put it back into a grass crop. And we have this huge pool of organic uh, nitrogen that gets mineralized and then is available. So um, that was one of the, the, the nice, in my opinion, one of the nice ahas that came out of this, this study. Um, in terms of timing of uh, manure nitrogen, this particular slide again shows a fall manure application and then you can see this uh, spike in soil nitrates. So um, we think we, you know, our, our timing was pretty good for picking up a number of these uh, management uh, practices and um, we had a pretty sensitive approach to being able to get that done. So overall findings, um, before I hand this over to Barb, um, when more nitrogen was applied than crop removed, Surprise, surprise, groundwater nitrate uh, increased. And in this case, it, at this particular site, it was above the MCL. Um, when the mass of nitrogen applied was similar to the amount that was needed by the crop, uh, <coughs> then we're seeing groundwater nitrate below MCL. So uh, just need to be targeting well what we think we're pulling off in the crop. Tillage added more nitrate to the mass, um, leached it, particularly in that early period. So we need to be really uh, uh, cognizant of that and, and, and 
factor that in when we're um, uh, turning these uh, grass lands back into uh, grass or back into corn. And then applying manure after the main growing season um, in, in a couple of times where we were able to look at it does result in a significant increase in groundwater nitrate. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Barb, uh, or excuse me, Charles, and he's gonna talk a little bit about um, aspects of uh, some of the um, moving into the modeling and the groundwater pieces. Thanks for having me. I'm just going to uh, been asked to speak for a couple of minutes about some of the tools that were developed or put together to help evaluate the, the data that was generated during uh, Barb and Joe's okay Barb and Joe's study here. Um, I want to emphasize that there are a lot of more sophisticated modeling tools that are out there. Um, numerical process-based tools. Dr. Harder and his colleagues are experts in the use of those tools. Frankly, they're really expensive to run. They're very data intensive. They take a lot of expertise. And as um, we often just don't have those kind of resources. So that's the tools that I'm going to describe today are sort of uh, an intermediate um, before those. Um, these are not formal regulatory tools, even though I work for the Department of Ecology. I'm just a technical person. Um, I better put on my glasses to see if I can read my notes here. Um, and I, uh, we recognize that um, we put them together to help evaluate the data for the study, and then we recognize that maybe some of these tools will be helpful to people that are just starting to kind of understand or learn about the connection between the agronomic world and the groundwater world. Great. So um, I kind of see these uh, somewhat as educational tools. Uh, they're really good in revealing some of the connections between loading and the groundwater quali quality consequences from that loading. And again, for an audience of people that may not be as familiar with the groundwater world, um, these are not super precise tools, but they're good for sort of starting to understand those two connections there. Uh, these are pretty simple, and when I say simple, they're idealized tools. We often call them box models. They're just, um, you, you imagine a perfect world, and then what would happen under perfect circumstances? And the more sophisticated modeling tools are usually meant to deal with the imperfections of the world. Um, they allow you, they're based on some standard mixing and mass balance principles that have been used for many, many years in the groundwater uh, world. Um, they allow you to input information about your site conditions that are specific to your particular site. And they do require a little bit of knowledge about you know, how nitrate behaves in the subsurface and a little bit of knowledge about groundwater and how it behaves as well. I think that there are, in addition to sort of being an educational tool, I think that uh, these tools can help people make decisions about application rates. You can use them to scenario play. You can use them to um, examine the sensitivity, what's really driving the consequences. What, what are the really the key variables in these systems that are making a big difference to the outcome? And of course, they're also good for allowing people to compare from site to site. There's three spreadsheet models that we've put together. Um, the first model, this NO3 leachate, it's a mixing box model and it essentially, it's allowing you to um, determine if you have a known amount of mass of nitrate in the soil column and you mix that with a known amount of recharge that's falling during a period of interest if you mix that up, fully mix that up, what's the, what's the leachate concentration going to be? Um, that's going to head towards the groundwater table. The second model is once you have that leachate arrive at the water table and enter into the groundwater system, and it mixes with the ambient groundwater that's flowing beneath the site, what's the outcome of that from a groundwater quality standpoint? 
And then the third model, like we call the backcast model, and the backcast model allows you to just reverse that process. You can start with a known or a desired groundwater condition, a nitrate condition in the aquifer, and you can back out, well, what does that mean? What sort of uh, leachate concentrations and nitrate loading were required in order to uh, uh, sustain that condition, that defined condition? This is just a, a conceptual schematic of the diagram. A lot of details about the model that I don't have time to discuss today. Um, but there are basically two boxes. The top box is this leachate box, and then the bottom box is what happens when you take that leachate and enter it into the groundwater system. There's a lot of dials and variables in the models, but I'm going to boil down sort of mathematically what they're doing. Um, if you just if you take a, a known amount of nitrate mass that's in your soil column, and you can either determine that from soil nitrate sampling, or you might be able to determine it from a farm mass balance analysis of your nitrogen use, inputs and outputs. If you end up with a mass of soluble nitrate that's there, let's imagine, at the end of the growing season, and you mix that mass with a known volume of recharge. And as a hydrologist, we have different tools for estimating, well, how much recharge is actually making its way through that soil column, through that vados zone, and down to the water table. You can get, you can predict what the solution concentration is by mixing those two things. Um, so that's what the, the, this first model essentially does from a mathematical standpoint. The, the forecast model and the backcast model, it, it's just a mixing box. You have two flows coming in. One is the groundwater flow that's coming in from the upgradient uh, boundary of the box. Uh, and, and we can characterize in, in uh, Barb's case, in Barb's study, she installed wells, she did aquifer testing. She determined the permeability of the deposits at the study site. She measured water levels and was able to determine things about hydraulic gradient and their amount of recharge coming into the system. If I turn that spigot on, and I know through Darcy's law how much groundwater is entering into the box from the upgradient side, and then I know something about the amount of leachate that's entering the top of the box from uh, by infiltrating down through the soil column and, and uh, meeting the, um, uh, hitting the water table, then I can mix those two and see what the outcome concentrations are. And what the backcast model does is, again, we take a known concentration or desired concentration. Let's say I want to know what sort of leachate condition and loading I need to maintain eight milligrams per liter in the aquifer. Or in Barb's case, the way she used these models is she said, um, I'm observing 22 milligrams per liter in the aquifer. And, and that's at essentially the purple outflow of the box on the diagram here. If I back out the upgrading contribution of the nitrate, then I can, say, I can determine something about what the leachate concentration is that's required to maintain that 22 milligrams per liter nitrate in the groundwater system. And then if you know something about the recharge, you can back that out of the leachate concentration and come up with a mass value of the nitrate loading that actually was occurring. And that's where we'll be discussing that in a few minutes here. All good modelers always admit what the limitations of their models are. So I'm just going to go through a few here. These models assume that the world is perfect, that everything is perfectly mixed. We know that that's not true. but Again, within these limitations, and I think in Barb's case, the, the, her use of this model in this particular setting was valid. A lot of the assumptions of the model are actually, her site was actually pretty close to some of those conditions. Time is not considered in the model like it is in a lot of other more sophisticated models. This is just a steady state model. It's what happens or the condition after all of the processes are complete. And what that means is you can't predict conditions at any given point out there in the field. It's sort of a 
this is what the average is going to be if things had really mixed up and combined together. Um, longer term, larger area, what is the average condition that's going to come out of this? And so I think as a result of these limitations, these are good tools for screening analyses, range finding exercises, scenario planning, again, determining which, uh, what variables are really critical in, in, uh, in, um, re in resulting groundwater impacts and um, determining um, perhaps relative sensitivities. And of course, models are never a replacement for direct monitoring in the field. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Barb. I think you do. So I'm going to tell you a little more about um, the groundwater monitoring and uh, I'm just starting out with this little cartoon to show you about our nitrogen mass balance estimates that we did for each year. Yellow boxes are things that we measured intensively and um, so the manure, um, grass harvested, irrigation water, nitrogen, fall soil nitrate and then the groundwater. Um, and it, this is like a summertime uh, scenario where the water table would be maybe uh, the most about 10 feet below the ground surface and uh, we did this for each year and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail but um, during the fall and the winter there's about 2.6 to 3.2 feet of precipitation during the wet period which is September through March which is about 60 to 70 percent of the total precipitation for the year um, and here's the winter scenario where the water table is between 0 and 4 feet uh, from the surface and um, the recharge, which is a subset of the uh, precipitation, was 1.6 to 2.5 feet. Um, so nitrate, how does it get to the water table? Um, as you've probably heard uh, today a lot about recharge, is the water that infiltrates through the, through the soil and beta zone and ends up in the water table. And it's the, the driving force for nitrate getting to the water table. And in this rainy area where we were studying, um, from the map that you saw up in the northwest corner of uh, Washington, northwest corner of the US, uh, it's very rainy. Um, and essentially, all the soil nitrate washes out into the water table um, in the earlier fall and early winter. And this has been shown in a number of studies up in uh, the part of the aquifer on the other side of the border. Uh, Agriculture Canada and University of Calgary have done a lot of studies up there and are still doing a lot. Um, and as you would imagine, the amount of recharge uh, affects the concentration of nitrate in the leachate. So the more recharge you have, uh, the lower the concentration, the more dilute the uh, nitrate would be. So in a study recently that uh, Agriculture Canada and University of Calgary did, um, they found later in the winter um, that the nitrate concentrations seem to be higher than they'd expect with all the, the uh, recharge that they get at that time of year. And this was at a raspberry field that they were studying very intensively. Um, and they, they suggested that the reason for that is that there's mineralization uh, occurring that adds new nitrate towards the end of the winter. And, um, so, uh, and that's mainly, I forgot to mention, that's mainly what I'm going to focus on is the wintertime results because Joe told you about the, the rest of it. Um, so here's a, a little map of our monitoring wells. They're the yellow dots here, and there were six of them, and they were about 12 feet deep and screened like this, the bottom seven feet were, were screened. Um, and we were sampling as close as we could to the top of the water table, about a foot and a half below the top of the water table, although it probably wasn't that exact. but. Um, um, so some of the samples that we collected while we were drilling the wells indicated there were quite, quite a bit of silt in some of them and clay, uh, which has some implications in this nitrate stuff. Um, we sampled monthly for four and a half years and 
we sampled for nitrate, an ammonia, total nitrogen chloride, and other related constituents. So here's the, the nitrate results for the winter, and I divided it into two parts, the early winter, November, December groundwater nitrate, and the January, March um, nitrate concentrations. And in four out of five years, the uh, nitrate concentrations were higher on the second part of the winter than in the first part. And uh, so they were like 11 to 30 milligrams per liter, and then in the first part, they were like 7 to 26 milligrams per liter. And we thought that was, whoops, wrong way. Uh, we were kind of surprised that uh, that would be happening because uh, there's about a whole other foot of recharge. There's about a foot of recharge or um, a little more, depending on the year, in the first part of the winter. And then the second part, you get a, almost a foot to a little over a foot. And so we would have thought that that nitrate concentration would become more diluted, but um, it wasn't. So um, we thought there may be some internal loading, which we've heard about this morning, mineralization possibly. So we looked at two ways to get a better idea of what was happening. One is looking at the chloride nitrate ratios in groundwater, and the other was looking at results from uh, using the model that Charles just talked about in the back, back cast version. So this first line of evidence that we looked at, the chloride nitrate ratios, um, help to interpret what was going on. Because chloride is a conservative ion, it doesn't react in the subsurface, and it would tend to be mineralized or diluted in the winter. Uh, whereas nitrate is not conservative, and uh, it can be transformed and increase or decrease uh, due to things other than dilution, like denitrification, mineralization. Um, so these three scenarios below kind of demonstrate these three uh, things that could be going on. If it's just a dilution situation, both nitrate and chloride would both be decreasing over time. Um, if it's just dilution going on with chloride, but <coughs> nitrate is decreasing, you'd see that, and that would be when denitrification was happening. And then here's another situation where nitrate is increasing while chloride is decreasing. Um, and this was a situation that we saw about 67% of the time between January and March. So in our second line of evidence is this backcast model. Um, as Charles was telling you, if we were looking at the purple part here, we, this was the concentration of nitrate in the six monitoring wells on average of January through March. Um, and we knew how, what the concentration was in the, in the groundwater just before that. We knew the recharge and all the other parts that go into the model. We had measured um, information for most of that. So with this information and that information, we were back, back calculating what is the loading that would be responsible or have to sustain that um, groundwater concentration of nitrate. So this is the results. Um, for each year, the total uh, pounds per acre of nitrate that would be required to cause those, um, those nitrate concentrations in the groundwater. The blue is the November-December uh, loading in pounds per acre, and the red is the January-March. So it ranged from, what was it, uh, 42 pounds per acre in 2007 uh, seven, oh, seven and 08 to 230 pounds per acre. Um, and so in January through March, that the red parts, uh, the total was 19 to 84 pounds per acre, which is about 43% of the annual loading, um, and an average of 49 pounds per acre. So it looks like there's ongoing nitrate loading uh, later in the winter that could be due to mineralization. So here's the bucket situation again. And uh, as Dr. Harder mentioned, kind of a rule of thumb is the 27 pounds per acre plus one foot of recharge is equivalent to 10 milligrams per liter. And our January through March data, if you put that into the equation, 19 to 84 pounds per acre plus the recharge that we observed, you get about 7 to 20 milligrams per liter in the January through March period, and an average of 13.6. So my take home message is um, we had a, a, an average of 11 to 30 milligrams per liter of nitrate in the groundwater. Uh, with no winter nutrient application, and that's higher than the early winter. 
the chloride nitrate ratios indicated that during this later winter period, uh, there was leaching from a source other than the end of season residual. And um, the backcast modeling indicated we had uh, a good bit of nitrate leaching in the second part of the winter, which translates to 7 to 20 milligrams per liter. And um, so uh, there's evidence that there's internal loading of some kind, possibly due to mineralization, and that uh, further research would probably be needed, looking at different soils, crops, climate, um, and that's it. Thanks. So this particular soil is about 8% organic matter. So it wasn't some of the 30 that was referred to earlier in the day, but it was up there. So you're going to have, um, in that type of system, I, I think you're going to have a lot of organic matter there that can be mineralized. Um, you know, the, these soils have had a long history of manure applications, so um, we're going to have a lot of material there to keep mineralizing. So. Apparently you have also answered, I'm sorry, Brian's question. So, any other questions? 